Muna, welcome to the show. Lovely to be here. Thank you for joining us today. So I, I have a lot of things I want to ask you, but I'm going to begin with something that might be a little random. Uh, but it's a little story. Uh, hopefully it's kind of funny. A couple of years ago, you posted something on one of your social media accounts. I, I think it was Facebook, but you were walking, uh, I think in a mall or maybe a traditional souk. And you came ac across a little stand, you know, a kushk that sells hijab for women, but they were selling the hijab for women with your picture on the packaging. <laughs> Do you remember this? So it happens quite a lot because um, there is one particular picture actually that has captured the imagination of Muslim hijabis um, in the past 15 years. And it was um, a picture with me wearing a silver colored hijab, which I have lost, unfortunately. I only wore it once. And this picture has been used to um, sell hijab, to sell oil uh, for hair. It has been um, used as political propaganda in Pakistan where they've added five children um, along with me um, saying that I'm voting for a certain hizb. It's oh, been wow. on the cover of uh, Muslim um, or Islamic books in Bosnia and so people and in Yemen I've seen it uh, people post me pictures of me in that particular hijab selling something or advocating for something uh, for 15 years now so it's, it's quite funny. So I, I collect them. Okay, so you've, you've accepted this as a fact. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, we don't really have copyright uh, uh, advocacy in, in, in the Eastern world. People feel if there's a picture on the internet or they got a picture, they can use it. Um, it's just flabbergasting to think that there is that one particular picture that people independently have liked and used. So it's, uh, it's an honor. It's an honor, of course. You're you're also, you know, um, an icon. I mean, uh, most people know you from the TV. Of course, I know you uh, otherwise. I mean, I'll get into that in a little bit. I mean, I, I know you because of your father, uh, <laughs> whom I, I've had the pleasure of meeting several times uh, when I was an undergraduate student. And I remember talking with him and, and, and feeling like, yeah, this guy's too smart for me. I, I can't talk to him because I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know how to respond to the things that he's saying. But that's how I know you. But I know most people know you from TV, from uh, Kalem Nawam. So I, th I thought maybe we would begin a little bit uh, there, if that's okay with you. Um, so, okay. yes. Well, I wanted to, you know, it's very, you know, groundbreaking work. Uh, I remember um, still, you know, from time to time when I'm in the Middle East, uh, it's on TV, old episodes are on. Uh, you guys tried to broach uh, very difficult topics, uh, you know, push the envelope. There's a very nice little documentary. I don't know if you saw it. I saw it on YouTube in preparation for this conversation where they actually go behind the scenes. There was a, f a film crew largely with you, but with some of your co-hosts. So, uh, you know, could you talk to us a little bit about that experience uh, and sort of, it was uh, 15 years, right? You were involved with Kalem Noir? I was on it for about 12 years of the 17 years that it was on. I think they have canceled the show this year. Um, one, because it's very difficult to make live episodes or new episodes with COVID. But also I think the era of that type of TV has over with social media really taking TikTok and Instagram and all these kind of stories um, taking over uh, that are instantaneous as things happen that have, and there's like, you know, now analysts a dime a dozen so people don't have to wait for um, a week or so for us to come on the show and discuss what we think. Uh, it was an era. Kalam Nawaim opened up a lot of um, people's homes and places that I would never would have thought that I could go into. Uh, it has made me um, a member of the family for many people. They say that they feel like I'm their, you know, next door neighbor or like their sister or their cousin or their mom. Now, their mom, actually. A lot of people are like, we used to watch you with our mom. And I'm like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> they're dating you. Yeah, they're dating you. So it's... Uh... So yeah, so dating me. But um, so the thing is, Kalam Nawam in particular uh, was a revolutionary show when it started in 2001. Our first episode actually aired, I think, December 2001, post-September 11. And I wasn't supposed to be on the show. I was supposed to be working behind the scenes. And then they said they actually would like me to be on TV. And it, being on TV is not something I ever thought about, wanted to be, or 
uh, even like really because I'm an extreme introvert. Um, and wait, what happened wait, wait was you, you want to convince me that you are an introvert. I am an extreme introvert. Really? Extreme, not just a normal introvert. Oh. I'm an extreme introvert. But uh, so one of the things about Kalam Nawaim was that it came after, you know, 9-11. And the reason I agreed to be on the show and I thought I'd be on the show only for about six months, holding a place until they find somebody else, was that I've never been able to see somebody who looked like me on Arab TV shows. Somebody mm. who is a moderate Muslim, who is muhajjaba, but maybe not the best muhajjaba, who is educated, who is young, speaking about normal stuff. If you ever saw a muhajjaba, it's usually a Ramadan show, or like an elderly lady doing some kind of kids show, or a guest on a show, but you didn't see presenters who looked like almost 50% of all Muslim women in, in the Middle East, right? We have a huge number of women who wear hijab. And part of it was because people didn't think um, that visually hijab would look nice. So I, I really tried to make sure that I wore, um, that I wore hijab that was nice. I spent a lot of time shopping, which I hate, to make sure that I always looked merattaba, well, um, uh, presented well. And there was nobody to be able to help me. Stylist did not touch anybody who wore hijab. And so it was a way to show that muhajjabas can be part of the conversation and can lead the conversation from A to Z. Um, and that was the only reason that I, I agreed to do it. And I continued doing it because I established really close relationships of friendships with Fawziya Salama, Farah Pseso, Rania Barghout, and Nashwar Rewaini, who are the original uh, Nawa'im. And it was partially my love for them that let me continue. And then I left the show for about five years. And I wasn't planning to ever come back. And uh, Fawziya calls me and says, if I don't come back, she's leaving the show. And there's nobody like Fawziya, Allah rahma. She was, she's an Arab treasure. She's somebody who lived a life that was encompassing of all the political changes and upheavals that happened. She was an expat who lived in England. I don't want to say immigrant. She was an expat, really. She was always Egyptian at heart. She is one of the first leaders of Arab media news air media so she and she knew pop culture like nobody else one of the most positive people and she, her value of being on the show i thought was greater than mine so i agreed to go back so that she would stay and uh, i stayed until she her death um about five years ago and uh the, the experience of kalam Nawam is interesting because i thought i was very cosmopolitan i had lived my life between Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and the US. Um, but what happened with Kalam Nawaim is that every single time we had a controversial uh, issue, and we had a lot of controversial issues. That's, that's, an understatement. Always, hmm? that's an understatement. You had a couple of controversial issues. <laughs> but we always approached it with dignity. We always approached it with dignity for the subject as well as the people who were going through it. And I think we never sensationalized it. And that's the reason we were never, never, not once, except actually once. We were censored once in all the years that we were on. And it was because we brought in a lawyer who said some stuff and we didn't realize what he was saying was wrong. And then somebody who fact checked, because we do fact checking, um, uh, fact checked the stuff before it was aired, said, look, he actually is using the wrong laws. Mm. And so for credibility reason, we took that part out, but we've never been censored and people don't believe this. And we've talked about everything under the sun, because as I said, our approach was about actually bringing comprehension and understanding and uh, empathy, um, and also to change the way things were. It wasn't about just ratings. It wasn't just about, you know, being trendy. It really was about helping people make choices and giving them the right information that they need to make these choices in the important parts of their life. So one thing I, I learned that I, preparing for this conversation, I didn't know, I didn't know that it was filmed in Beirut. Yes, it was. So what, what was, was that schedule like for you and the impact that that had on your, on your family, on your, on your kids? So if I wasn't divorced, I would not have been able to do Karam Now I'm, uh, I was a divorced single mom of two. I had a great supportive system with my mom helping me out, my sister traveling with me to Beirut every time I went. 
um, of course, Beirut is one of the most beautiful, or it used to be, unfortunately, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Uh, the culture, the history, the Arabness, the mixture, it, just an amazing, beautiful city um, to be able to visit. It was a privilege. And we would go for four days every month. It usually was on the weekend when my kids were with their dad and then um, a day before and a day after. And I would uh, tape uh, all the episodes for the month. Um, it was neck breaking work, very hard. And I would come back um, and then take my kids from their father and basically continue for you know, the whole month. And then every month that would be repeated for one weekend. Um, so it was doable. So for four uh, four days a month, the commitment, but then an opportunity. Did your kids ever go with you? A couple of times. I think my kids were with me on one episode for Mother's Day. Mm. I think I took them a couple of times when they were having their vacation, the like you know summer vacation or it was a winter vacation. So I would take them, and then my mom would come with me as well um, to help uh, entertain them while I'm at work. But usually, no. Usually, I went by myself. As I said, uh, because the kids were. Um, divided between me and their dad, uh, the custody. It was easy for me to schedule. And, and the show was very uh, nice about it. They allowed me to set the schedule that, uh, you know, that suited me. So we always um, uh, taped on the, on the weekend. Um, mm-hmm. We also taped when there was the invasion in 2006. We went to Cairo and we taped in Cairo for a couple of months. That mm-hmm. was also beautiful. The best lightning person in the whole world actually is Egyptian. Uh, even Disney movies use him. And he came on and he was doing our show. And until now, I've never been lighted as well as that guy. He, okay. Amazing. His amazing experience and expertise in Egypt and Beirut in uh, the movie making business, which translates as well to TV. Sure. So. I mean, I think people listening to this, the audience, largely English speaking people, they might not necessarily get how avant-garde it is for somebody like you to do a show like that at that time. I mean, even now it would be, you know, some of those topics are still considered taboo. Now, unbeknownst to you, I'm actually, my mother is Saudi. Ah, Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I have I my, my mother, I don't be cute. My mother's side is, is Meccan. And actually one of my aunts uh, is a single mother uh, in Jeddah. So I saw firsthand growing up when we would go and spend, believe it or not, I would spend summers in, in Jeddah. I mean, not the, not the, yeah, I know, not, not the destination. The not the best time for summer. <laughs> but that's, that's actually where I met my wife. So I, for me, Jeddah is a very uh, special, a special city. But I saw firsthand the kind of struggles that she has and had working in the in the Saudi workforce as a single woman, uh, as a divorced woman, uh, and and to add to that, uh, you know, you're doing this show where you're very much out there as a woman. I, you know, a lot of people were upset with you, are upset that a woman is, you know. Um, so it was a different time. I mean, Saudi Arabia right now has changed so much over the past three years. Uh, in many unbelievable ways, but it only was able to change because change has been happening slowly. And then it's sort of like a domino effect. It all caught up. So at the time that I started the show, uh, women, a lot of women didn't even put their pictures in the newspapers. If they wrote a a column, they would use um, Kenya, they would use pseudonyms, they would, they would, or they would use their first and um, second names only, not their family name. So I think I was the first Saudi woman to actually use her full real name on TV. I mean, there's so many things that you say now and you're like, what? I can't believe this was in at that time, but that was the, the culture at the time. We were very conservative. Or let me put it in another way. The conservatives had a strong hold on the culture. A lot of people were not conservative, but the conservatives um, were able to lead the conversation and lead the, uh, the way that people led their life. And so I remember when I first got on TV, people from all over the Arab world would be like, we didn't know Saudi women were like that. I'm like, what do you mean? We've had women mm. educated for years. They, they, you know, people come to Mecca for Umrah. Didn't you see these women? And somehow it was 
because Saudi didn't have um, a TV series like the Egyptians did, or they were not into the movie making. So people didn't really see Saudi culture. It was really a big mystery. And I was one of the first to, um, to show the other side of, of Saudi Arabia. Um, but what was very interesting is that we also had a huge audience of the expat communities, the Arabs in the US, uh, the Arabs in the UK, uh, Arabs in Malaysia. So we would be getting all these letters from Arabs all over the world or people who spoke Arabic watching us. Um, there was something about the show that just, you know, appealed to a large uh, segment of society. Uh, for me as a single uh, woman or single mom, as you said, um, it wasn't easy. But I think two things made a huge difference. First of all, I really did have the support of my parents who didn't want me to be on TV. My parents are very private people and they're like, what do you mean you're gonna talk about your life and people know things about you. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, they didn't want me to do it, but they were supportive of whatever I chose to do. So I had that help. I also, I had a mentality of somebody who had, I'm a third culture kid who had to move between um, countries, cultures, um, you know, from the East to the West to the Middle East. Uh, we traveled a lot. And so I'm able to adapt very quickly to whatever is thrown at me. I never think I can't do something. I mean, I used to tell people like, other than like surgery or like maybe um, creating like an actual car, not designing, but mm. creation of an actual car, I think I can do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> if I put my mind to it, I mm. could learn it and I can do it, but I won't risk it with somebody's life. I won't be a surgeon and I won't risk it with actually like creating something that somebody would drive, but I could design a car. I mm. could think about better ways to make operations. I could think of ways of looking at the world from any type of job. And I know it. I have such great confidence in my abilities that I could learn um, that the mind is a wondrous thing. Um, that I just was never intimidated by any challenge. So you talked about, uh, you know, being uh, a hijabi on the show and, you know, not seeing people like you, rep you know, representing you in the media. That That's now like a booming sector, right? The, the hijabi oh, influencer, yes. the hijabista, uh, hot hijab. I mean, I know this from my wife, so please don't get yes, any. Yes, there's I'm so not... many. <laughs> but... I, to be honest uh, and just completely transparent, I'm fascinated by that because I have a daughter. She's still very young, but I always wonder in the back of my, in my mind, you know, how, what kind of influence or it, what will influence her, uh, you know, based on our moral paradigm. I mean, I know for my boys, it makes a little bit more sense because I'm a guy, I grew up, I kind of understand that, but that is quite significant need, needing to have that. Do you have any thoughts on where that, little movement is now with you know instagram stars and uh, hijabi i mean without getting into the controversies or any of the, anything like that but could you comment on on the importance or lack of importance of that so it's very important to have role models people that look like you think like you that give permission for you to be yourself um and we hope that this is in a positive way right because we're seeing it in a racist way with the president of the United States coming out and saying negative things and people feeling emboldened to actually bring some of those feelings into the public sphere and then creating a lot of polarization. But in a positive way, when you see somebody who looks like you, acts like you, thinks like you, has your same moral or uh, values succeeding, it gives you permission to feel like, oh, I could also do that. Uh, because if every time you see somebody who's successful, looks different than what you look like or makes different choices and you never see yourself that makes you think that you can't go there and uh, it's I, there's a saying it's like you can't be what you can't see right um so i think we did help change that i don't think it is as prevalent in media as it as it should be i think we should have a lot more hijabi women in the media not in their own social media but like being accepted as part of the whole milieu. Um, I started a hijab business actually in 2006, uh, one of the first people that started it. And the whole point was how can I actually help create modern clothing because shopping just took 
forever and you either look like a flower pot or you look like an ethnic person <laughs> you know like ethnic wear and i'm living i want to i want to be able to go to milan and look like i'm italian uh you know wearing italian clothes or go to the states and look like i'm an american wearing american clothes but also be hijabi mm. and so being like where is the modern hijab where is the westernized hijab that looked very elegant and very modern and did not have uh, you know uh, a cultural bent uh, so that wasn't there this is what i tried to to create uh, i realized i wasn't a great businesswoman so i folded my um, company around in 2011 or 2012 um, but we look at today where there's a proliferation of muhajjabas and a lot of them are very young and they're very fashionable and some of them i'm not sure is hijab to tell you, the truth. <laughs> you know but at least they're trying um it's a it's an attempt to find their own um style and when you're very young and 15 and 16 you want to be a lot more fashionable than when you are in your 40s for example so i think maybe also part of the age uh uh, issue is that I don't understand what they're wearing, but at least they're trying. And there's other girls like them that are also trying, and and they find each other, and they and it's a huge movement. I mean, there's a a lot of them. The other thing is that we're finding a lot of women once they become very successful, they actually take off their hijab. Correct. And yeah. that's actually yes, that's actually yeah, uh, quite sad um, because I think. Even despite the movement with a lot of hijabis and hijab um, styles coming out and hijab fashion brands and all these things, there's still a stigma about being a muhajjaba and being part of a global world and being successful. And that to be successful uh, at a certain level, you need to look like everybody else. So it's a bit sad. We're still not really at the level of complete acceptance of choices of women's wear, whatever she chooses to wear as independent of her intelligence and of her position. Yeah, I had another guest on the show and we were saying something similar. He was a guy, but we were talking about business. And I said, you know, I, I always find uh, when, when uh, people become very successful in business, there's, some, there's somehow an inverse relationship to their practice of Islam. Like why? Why can't you just be very good at business and aggressive and and shrewd? But you know, you know, just pray five times a day. What's the big deal? Why can't you be a hijabi and be successful and and just remain a hijabi? And the reason I find it peculiar is that there was a time in the world, believe it or not, where Europeans dressed like us, you know, dressed like Muslims, because that was fashionable and that was like considered. No, 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 no. It wasn't fashionable. It was because we were the dominant and strongest culture, and people imitate that and. Part of the hijab is that we're no longer dominant or as the successful culture. We're actually, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, we, we, we've lost a lot of um, advancement. And uh, some people even change their names. They deny, they say we're, you know, culturally Muslim. They're even, or, or we come from Islamic origins um, because they really want to distance themselves from all the problems that they perceive uh, Muslims to have, and that comes with you whether you're living in the Muslim world or you know go into the into the U.S. And as I said, when you look at successful Muslims um, in the Western context, most of them do not wear hijab. I think Ilham Omar is one of the very few women um, who does that, and she does it in um, the turban style most of the time because it's a little bit more palatable. Uh, it's also multi-ethnic right so it's a little bit like never tt it's a bit african it, mm. it, it encompasses a lot of elements from different cultures and so people and it's even even turbans are used in fashion sometimes so a little bit tailor wore them um but proper hijab like as we understand what proper hijab is you know covering the neck covering all of your hair wearing looser fitting clothes that's you don't see that in successful um Western uh, concept of being successful um, women. So one of the statements you made that, that trended for a little bit, I, I can't remember when this was, but uh, you were uh, known for saying, you know, hijabi naqus. You know, I know that. And, hijabi naqus, yeah, yeah, I know yeah. that. And um, uh, I, 
I, I mean, I'm very, uh, it's very hard for me to say, I want to be very sensitive because I'm, I'm cognizant that I'm a guy and I'm not trying to, you know, get into your lane. I'm the only one who's allowed to say that hijabi is not. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm just something. quoting you. But it is one... something to do with me. Nobody else has the right to come and tell me what to do. Not just me, I mean, men do not have the right to come and tell a woman how she should dress or not dress. That's none of their business. This is something between you and God. Now, what I believe proper hijab to be is as from what I've studied is that so no hair would show, right? It would always be looser fitting clothes. Um, and so I don't always practice that. I think several reasons. One, I think that the modern world uh, needs a little bit more flexibility. And so you want to blend in, you want to actually do things that are a little bit more, you know, um, fun, and that requires you to maybe wear things a little bit tighter, stuff like that. It's, it's not, I, I mean, I, I, would, I would have hoped by now um, that my hijab would have become better, but it hasn't. But I'm comfortable with myself. I, I think I do a lot of other things that are important as well, Islamically. Hijab is not my only uh, Islamic practice, and it's not for most women. Um, it's just part of the package, and so I think the rest of the package is pretty good. So I, I'm no, okay I, with I agree with you 100%. Uh, not judging. I mentioned that because what I wanted to say is you opened up with that statement like this space for women to say, look, I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying, and this is my struggle. And because the hijab is so, you know, physically you see it, uh, and men, you know, uh, we don't have the equivalent usually. But I can say the same thing about myself. I'm trying. I know that I'm naqis in my prayer. I know that I'm naqis in my, you know, my interactions with my family. I know that I'm naqis in, in this and that. And therefore, I'm trying, you know. And, and that's, that's what we call the, the greater jihad. That's our struggle. Mm -hmm. And I think that statement uh, from, you know, the women in, in my world, uh, I, I think that people found that very liberating. Like, ah, you know, akhiran, you know, somebody finally is saying, you know, what needs to be said, which is, look, I'm trying, I'm struggling. It's not black or it's not white. And, and yeah. the funny thing is when I studied, uh, I remember uh, many times I would be in the mufti's office in Egypt and a woman would come in and would ask a hijab related question. And he'd be like, I'm not going to answer that question. You know, just go live your life and like actually send them back. You know, be like, oh, is this haram? Is this halal? If this, he's like, no, I'm not going to answer any of those questions. And I would say, you know, Maulana, why would you say that? And he's like, you know, the story of the Baqara in, in Surah Al-Baqarah. Yes, yes, uh, the details. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Said, don't ask. And he's awesome. like, and, that, and that's what he taught me. He's like, don't, uh, don't get into the details. Let people live their lives their life and let them find their way to Allah Ta'ala. That's so what I was going to say. So, <laughs> yeah, For hijab and for other Muslims, there's, you know your, your heart, right? You know when your heart is clean and you're trying to do stuff and you know when you're really lying and, and, and fooling yourself and getting away from that purity of love for all of humanity. And so you have that kind of connection. And I think that connection, which is a lot more difficult to maintain and to really be as pure-hearted as you are able to, you know, tirtaqi, to go up in, in that. Um, uh, hijab al-nafs, which is al-hishma from inside, being modest from inside, the way that you're acting, the way, that's a lot more difficult and it's not visible and it takes a lot of work. And so I'm more preoccupied with that, always making sure that I, you know, Islam is a lifestyle. It's not, Islam is not about just praying five times a day. So your prayer doesn't count if you're not actually taking that essence of the prayer and applying it to the rest of your life, right? If you are doing facade, if you're doing, if you're, you know, uh, reshwa, um, fraud, all these kind of things. And it's supposed to, uh, the prayer is supposed to prevent you from doing bad things to others between the two prayers. And if you end up doing bad things, then the essence of the prayer wasn't done and therefore it doesn't count and so there's so much more about living life with values being there for people helping people developing your own self protecting your own self protecting your own energy um having that um right having 
being soft of heart. So there's so much work to do as a Muslim. Hijab is just a small part of it that usually comes for me as a result of all the things before it, whereas most people see it as the beginning. And that's, and it, as you said, it's very visible, right? So it becomes a way of control. If she wears hijab, she's that kind of person. If she doesn't wear hijab, she's not that kind of person. And all these like things happen around it just because it's visible. It's only part of the equation. Uh, I think people emphasize it too much. Both of my daughters don't wear hijab. But I hope that I've raised them with hishma inside of their hearts, um, of empathy with people, of connection with God. And so, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the hijab conversation just takes a huge space um, in our um, Islamic discussions when it shouldn't, just because it's so easy and so visible to know whether you're doing it or not. I mean, seriously, how many young kids pray for all five prayers? Or, or uh, like you said, the bigger problems, you know, the, the people that are engaging in, you know, a criminal or illegal activity, people that are abusing other people. I mean, that stuff is, we're going to be judged on that stuff too, right? You know, we're going to have to answer for those things. So a, a while ago, you said, you know, mashallah, you're very confident in your skills, minus building a car and, and surgery. Uh, you seem to be very, you know, mashallah, confident uh, in your identity, would it be fair to say that a lot of this is your father's influence? You've talked, you've spoken publicly. Definitely, definitely, definitely. My father is the biggest influence in my life. So my father, Dr. Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman, is an Islamic thinker who has worked for the Ummah for the past, I don't know, 60 years, since 1958, I think. Um, and he's somebody who has devoted himself to bettering the Ummah through education, uh, he's not political at all. He doesn't belong to any Hezb or any party or never. He, he doesn't believe in these things. He believes in you learn the Quran, you learn uh, the Hadith, you learn from uh, the Islamic scholars, and then you start to create your own Islam that fits you. And he's an extremely confident person in himself. And his, I think he gave us that, this ability to think that everything lies within and that the brain has a lot of power that you can cultivate, um, that you make your own. So since we're very young, Baba, let us make our own choices. He would say, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And he is one of the wisest people I've ever met. And I know a lot of people say this, but he is, as you said, in the beginning of the talk, yeah, yeah, he right. has a way of looking into the future and seeing how things happen and, predicting stuff and it comes to pass. So things that he told me about 20 years ago, he's like, don't do this. Don't sign this. It's not a good idea. And I'd be like, okay. So I'd follow because he convinced me. And then 20 years later, if I had done what he said, I would have been in so much trouble. I, if I hadn't, if I had gone against what he said, mm. I would have been in so much trouble. And so he just has this way of being able to, oh, sorry, excuse me. Just it's Maghrib prayer in uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia. So um, he has this way of really seeing the issues at heart, not being distracted by the noise, uh, knowing um, human um, nature very well, and making decisions based on that. And one of the things that he always says: never make a decision in, unless you absolutely have to. So wait until the very last moment so that you can have all the information and then make it. And sometimes I would go against what he thinks because of my own experience, et cetera. Once I made that decision, he supports it. He doesn't like, he doesn't say, well, I told you this is going to happen. So I, I'm not going to help out. No, no, he would always support me. Um, so he gave me a lot of confidence because I know I could always, if I, if I make a mistake, if I fall, He's there to catch me. And that love of a parent is great, as well as having his intellectual power when I would be struggling with issues for the show or for other things saying, well, this is the way I think about this, but what do you think? And he would come and he say, well, you're thinking about this because of this, you know, one, two, three, but you have to really look at this context. And it's something that I would never have thought about, something that happened 800 years ago in Islam or things that are um, about human nature. And I would see why the real answer should be that versus this. 
um, and, and for the show, I have to say sometimes I would hold back on my own opinion and I would give my father's opinion because you are talking to people from all the way from Morocco to Iraq. And he has visited all these countries. So like he tells me, word it this way. If you're gonna say this, this is the wording you need to do. And I'd be like, okay. And I, I would word it that way. Three, four years later, somebody from Iraq would call me up and say, remember when you said this, that made me go and research and that made me do this and that made me do that. And I realized that my dad was really so well aware of all the context that he knew that this could change somebody's life in, in some of the controversial, uh, the mm -hmm. more controversial subjects. And I mean, I'm just so grateful that I've had him in my life. Alhamdulillah. You know, you've spoken very fondly of him and actually your, you and your father popped up for me in the most random, you know, scene that I'm going to tell you. So uh, I, uh, I went to go see a book launch in downtown Washington, D.C. a few years ago with Tim Ferriss, who's launching okay. his new book. And my wife and I are driving back and uh, we look in the index and look, oh, my God, Munaibu Suleiman is in the book. So we pulled over, <laughs> you know, and we pulled to your chapter and I read, you know, the, four, the few chapters that I have in, in front of me. And one of the things that you attribute to your father is the statement, take it easy, ya azizi. Yeah, as easy, yes. <laughs> so my father, it's this whole thing about the dunya being fania, right? Mm. So don't agitate over things. Don't, life is much easier than you think. It's not as bad as the bad scenarios. So two things. He says, first of all, never make a decision until the very last moment. I love that. That's going to be my new motto. I, I absolutely, I, I totally Anything understand what he means by that. Yes anything that's irreversible don't take that decision until the very last moment don't make a decision that you cannot uh bear the, the worst consequences of it so you're going to say a b c d can happen if d happens can i actually live with that mm. and mm. so that's something else and then the third one is that whatever happens take it easy yeah as easy don't and that like some people like I've been attacked a lot on Twitter and people are like how come you're so very calm why doesn't the bullying bother you and I'm like you know it's just words on you know so what what so if this happens to me so what I mean mm. it's three years of life I'm doing my best I know who I am I'm not gonna let other people you know take the joy out of life for me and they did for a little bit the first time it happened the first time you get bullied on social media with thousands of people, whether they're bots, they're not, it doesn't matter. Everybody attacking you, you just go like, yeah. what just happened? It and then stings. it goes on. It, it stings. stings. And, 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 and especially that I was so loved before. Um, <laughs> and it's not something, nobody, nobody can prepare you for this. Mm. Um, but after that, I became extremely easy about it. And people are like, you know, it's been going on for four years on and off. It's, Anybody who's on social media now has to have it. And I'm like, because mm, I, I don't really care about them. I'm, I take it easy, as easy, life goes on. Just go on to the next step, uh, do the best you can and you know, hope for the best and live your life. So Mona, one of the roles that I know you also from uh, in your previous work was uh, working for His Royal Highness Prince Al-Walid, uh, running the foundation. We met there once before and uh, you know, that's that's a big task. And one of the things I read about you commenting on that is that I think you at one point you told His Royal Highness, I, I would like some executive training. And then yes. you said, I, then I realized working for him is the executive training. <laughs> so, so I've yes, been yeah. in that office before, like all the way in the top of the tower and it's very intimidating and everything's like very fast paced. And, you know, I thought I was fast paced because I'm an American, but that was really fast paced. I mean, it was something, it was something completely else. Can you talk so, a little bit about that experience? So, yeah. So, this was like a, a MBA in... Uh, in <laughs> real life. Real life person, MBA. Real life, one person MBA. So, there's a couple of things that were very interesting about Al-Walid. First of all, he had very small teams. And so, each team member had a lot more responsibilities for a huge conglomerate than is usual. 
so I think we're all 60 people, uh, all in all, running this um, the show from A to Z. So you for got the foundation. For the, not just the foundation for his business. So um, really, only 60 people. Only 60 people, and wow. basically you knew these people and so our work intersected so i wasn't just dealing with philanthropy i one of the most beautiful things that i've ever seen that he did was he allowed us to sit on any meeting that we wanted so every day we would have his schedule and he's the most punctual detail oriented person i've ever seen in my whole life um every day we would have his meetings and it could be about something in hospitals it could be about something in hotels it could be about investments it could be about real estate it doesn't matter if you're one of the top managers, you can ask to sit on any meeting and he will allow you. And so you would be able to see how he would conduct that meeting and then go to the next meeting that's still about the same issue, but from a different angle, different people. And what are the types of questions that he would ask? And he would explain sometimes if you ask him like, well, why did you say this here? Why did you say that in that meeting? And he would explain his thinking it was fascinating. Um, because he was so detail oriented as well, you couldn't make a mistake and he had the best memory ever. He would remember what you said like six weeks ago or six mm -hmm. years ago, six months ago. And so if you come back and say, well, this is how it is, he'd be like, but that's not what you said six months ago. You're like, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> I don't remember what I did this morning. <laughs> I don't remember what I did this morning. And so he forced me to become a lot more detail oriented and I'm not, I'm a big picture kind of person. I like to draw mm -hmm. strategy and look at how the pieces fit and then have people. Um, he would notice if there's a comma mistake in any letter. Mm. When it's gone through proofreading several people, things like that. I mean, he, he, he was just able to catch the smallest details, the smallest numbers, and know that they didn't belong in, in, in a place or... So I learned a lot from him. And also, one of the things that I've also loved working for the foundation is that Whenever I asked for a training for me or the people that worked under me, it was immediately given. And you have to know this was not normal at the time in Saudi Arabia or in the Arab world. Um, and it was you know, extremely costly. But I would say, well, we're expanding into this. And I think we need these, these three people to have this type of training. So that, and it would be immediately approved. Um, but he worked you very hard. Like he only sleeps four hours a day. And basically you're on 24 20 hours of the 24 hours a day um, waiting for, uh, you know, his uh, comments or, if, and he reads every single paper. So it could be that he's reading the paper that you sent him six o'clock at night. He'd be reading at three in the morning and that's when he's sending you a message hmm. that you need to answer. So. And how long were you in that role for? I was there from 2004 to 2011. Okay. And I think I met maybe one of your successors, Abir. I think, yes. yeah, I met Abir, uh, who, who oddly enough is somehow a, a friend of a friend of my wife's. I didn't even know, I didn't know, I didn't know who Abir was until I met her. And I was telling my wife, oh, I'm meeting with this person. She's like, oh, I know her. She's Fulana's friend. Because my wife grew up in Jeddah, as I mentioned, ah, yes. as well. She's Egyptian, but she grew up in Jeddah. Uh, and then is it, if, I, if memory serves me correctly, I think the prince's wife is now running the foundation. Mm -hmm. so after I left, the prince, uh, we had... Nadia Bakhorji for about a few months, and then the prince's wife, and then they got a divorce, and then Abir came in, I think, and then oh, now Abir was post the wife. Okay, okay. Post wife, and then there's I think now Princess Lamia who's leading it for the past few years, and of course the foundation has also changed from the time that I was there. It has grown, it has uh, restructured um, different strategies, different interests. Saudi Arabia now takes a, a huge part of their. Um, you know, uh, uh, work, whereas before it was a lot more international, educational, humanitarian um, during my time. But, you know, they're doing phenomenal work. My, my experience is that uh, he, his decision making is quick. Is that accurate? Like he can make a decision quickly and decisively. It's, it's accurate and it's not accurate. As I said, he's able to retain huge amounts of data in his mind going back to years so he's making a quick decision but it's based on a lot of information now the the weight of information that he gives we might agree with it or disagree so he might you know that that's that's it's, it's his own decisions but it's a quick decision but it's based on a huge data reserve like 
basically a computer kind of like calculating stuff and going in. Um, uh, so as I said, true and not true. True and not true. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, he, he's making it based on knowledge, but uh, uh, maybe- a huge, I, huge amount of knowledge. Huge amount of knowledge, a huge yeah. amount of precise knowledge. Mm, very accurate. Well, it's, it's good to know that it's still going. You know, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that philanthropy is a big part of the Gulf, uh, not, oh, just, yes. not just Saudi, but other, other GCC countries. And um, people are extremely generous uh, in what they support. Uh, I think one of the problems in my experience, I mean, I was a little bit involved in, in, in philanthropy in that part of the world, is it's not always organized. So it's a different, so again, this is Western Eastern construct, right? So first of all, a lot of the philanthropy that is made in the Arab world doesn't go through the UN. So it doesn't get counted in the Western context, right? So right. you don't see Egypt being one of the top, you know, donors to, uh, uh, you know, uh, the UN, but a lot of Egyptians who are extremely wealthy would be donating huge amounts of money, whether inside of Egypt or in Africa or outside, for example, same thing with the Gulf. Um, also, the philanthropy is more heart. We are an emotional kind of um, yeah, for, very much. People. And so, Al Walid was very organized, was very structured, um, and so is I think a couple of foundations in in Kuwait, um, Emirates as well. But the majority of philanthropists are more emotional, and so they will give according to how they feel. It's changing now with the second and third generation of family businesses coming in and CSR kind of like taking root uh, for the past 10, sorry, uh, taking root for the past 10, 15 years. And uh, you're seeing now foundations that are popping up that are a little bit more structured, a little bit more organized, a little bit more focused um, with the, with leaders that are actually, you know, uh, nonprofit leaders leading them versus a member of the family. Uh, with people who are with financial backgrounds or investment banking, leading the endowment part. So you're seeing a lot of changes, but it's going to take some time. And also, it's interesting that a lot of women are involved in philanthropy. That was also something that, I mean, you, you, you being the most notable example for me, but I was surprised that women were, were directly involved in charitable giving, in, in grant writing, uh, involved in the projects, which again, is a positive, I mean, I think so a positive talking, thing. Are we talking about the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, or the Middle the, East? Just GCC specifically, but the Middle East more generally. So I think the charity sector has always had a lot of women in it, um, just due to the idea of women wanting to help and not wanting to have normal work. So that was a way to work, but also be giving back to society. Um, so from, you know, the 1950s, you'd find a lot of organizations that would have women uh, be the back and uh, the backbone of it. Um, I think in the decision making, as more women became wealthy, they started their own NGOs and they would be the chairman of the board, for example, mm. uh, and they would hire a lot of women. So you find a lot of uh, ladies working in the charity sector because the opportunity also opened up uh, for them to be part of that workforce. But the real money is mostly with men in philanthropy. Do you think that will change over time more? So I, I don't think so, because I think what happens is that the women in the families actually end up all pooling their money with like the father or the son and him taking over uh, the philanthropic uh, sector. So as we said, there's exceptions, women who are doing it on their own, and a lot of them, um, women working within the sector itself, just as jobs. But if you're looking at the, the biggest grants, it's usually a male who controls it on behalf of the family. So, Mona, one of the other things I learned about you, which was new for me, was your involvement at Yale as a, as a fellow. And I'd love to learn more about that. I, um, uh, I think it w in conjunction with the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. I was involved with the Yale World Fellows in 2009 before they became the Greenberg Fellows um, as a global fellowship, trying to bring leaders from all over the world and give them a network and skills that they would need to you know, do their work. It was one of the best fellowships that I've, been, I've ever been on. 
um, it opened up um, a lot of expertise, especially in the divinity schools and in the business, um, the management, um, Salon Management School, um, so that I was able to lean on that later on for other things. Um, but it was not associated with Tony Blair uh, at all at the time. I don't know if it became associated with him later on. I do know Tony Blair came to Yale, but I've never attended anything for Tony Blair. And how long were you at Yale for? Uh, oh, it was six months. Six, six months. months. So it's not the it's not the prettiest city. Uh, having gone to Princeton, I, I always have to point out the deficiencies in the other Ivy Leagues. But yeah, yani, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Yeah, no. I see. This is what I told you about being a third culture kid. You you put me anywhere, I'll find uh, you know a beautiful spot. I had a beautiful, a little home that I rented out for me and my children there. They went to school there. Um, New York was just an hour and a half away. You can throw me anywhere in the world, and I will enjoy the place that I'm sitting in. When was the last time you were in Washington D.C.? D.C. I would say last year. So sometime maybe. I was February in Harvard of 2020. So I would say probably November, November of 2019. So you still, you still, you know, come back. Oh, yes, yes, my brother lives there. I, I go back quite a lot. Oh, I didn't know that. You still have family here. I love the US. I grew up there. Fairfax County is where I, you know, went to school. I love Adams Center, which my parents helped build. I feel like I have a lot of friends because I grew up there. And so it's, it's home. Well, it would be very nice to host you post COVID, inshallah, whenever that is. The next okay. time you're in town, we definitely would love to to host you. Um, uh, Mona, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to, any thought or advice you'd like to, to leave? Actually, I would like advice from you. So I think that the Muslim community in the US, and I think this is the majority of our audience, needs to look at how can we coalesce to really become a strong party, um, a strong voting bloc, um, to enable each other to um, get to better positions within areas that are of influence, whether it's media, law, education, um, politics, um, support the philanthropy, support the institutes, support the projects, support the initiatives, Support, suppose the scholarships for students that are coming from abroad uh, into the US um, and also just work together to really be strong. I think sometimes in the Muslim community, whether it is people of Arab descent, people of uh, you know South um, East Asian descent versus African Muslim, African American Muslims, sometimes they get into these kind of little fights of saying that we're not respected as much or we're not as welcome. And, and our generation should be the generation that ends all of that, where we become really all Muslims, um, accepting each other uh, despite differences, um, looking out for each other, uh, trying to see how we can strengthen each other, what are our strengths, and even build that more up. And really donate to all the good causes and be there and be part of the community. It's, it's really important. I think. There are some people doing great work, but they're not getting the support that they need. I think there's a lack of structure, a little bit of how we can um, come as a community to look at the gaps that are there and fill them. Um, and it's gonna take a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot of dedication, um, but it's needed. Uh, I mean, for everybody in the US, it's home, right? So you need to build up your home. And I, and I would like specific personal advice from you on uh, being the father of a daughter. How old is she? Uh, well, she's a twin. She has a boy, a, a brother twin, but the twins are 11. 11 years old. So... You know, like 11 going on 16. Okay, so I, this is not <laughs> going to be very popular, but I think that a very strong sense of identity of being very proud of Muslims, of Islam, of your culture where, so your, your daughter is probably a quarter Saudi, three quarters Egyptian, um, to really know uh, the history and the literature of the places that her parents came from and her grandparents came from and have that kind of link. But also really like, 
just have a lot of confidence in her abilities. I think that's something that all girls need. Okay, I'm gonna have fun for her, for, her, for her to go to Princeton from now. Like, make sure that you're doing your okay. your part. I'm going to have her listen to this, you know, at least this end part of the episode. So I definitely want her to, to hear your advice. So every time I can say something, I'll be like, but Muna said. Muna said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, like, if you, your kids are, I think Sayyidina Ali said, your kids are not made for the same time that you were made for. it, And mm, so you have true. to let them explore and you have to let them come to what they want out of life. You guide, you help, but there is a limit, you know, after 18, we know that they make their own decisions, but you kind of, until that time, you structure it for them so that when they do make the decisions, they make it, they make decisions based on values and that you can't go wrong with that. Great advice. Thank you, Mona, very much. I sincere, sincerely appreciate that. Thank you for making the time uh, with the time difference and all of that. Yeah. And I, I wish you the best of luck and I look forward to seeing and hearing from you soon, inshallah. Just a lot of